guys, welcome back to Food Prep Guide. If you grow a garden, you are likely familiar with the USDA zone map. It's just a map where the um, USDA has kind of divided up the country into different zones based on the lowest average temperatures for that zone. And it gives us an idea of what will grow well in our area at certain times of the year. Uh, if you don't haven't heard already, the zone maps have changed. They updated them at the end of 2023, and it's going to affect our 2024 garden year. Maybe we're going to talk about that, about whether it actually changes anything or not. But I want to go over the changes, and then more specifically, I want to talk about how I am going to be responding to these changes and what I am doing in particular to prepare for future changes based on the trend lines that I'm seeing. Let's get started. If you would like help planning a productive garden, scroll down to the description box of this video and click this link for a free garden printable. We calculated quantities for a year's supply of the most common garden vegetables and organized them into a neat chart to help you plan. We'll send it straight to your inbox. If you're new here, we invite you to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our upcoming tutorials on gardening and food preservation, food storage, and more. Okay, zone map. I will, in the description box, give a link to the USDA zone map website where you can go, you can enter your zip code and find out what zone you are in if you haven't already. If you have and you didn't know that it has changed, you might want to go over there just for funsies and see what kind of new zone you might be in. In general, most zones increased by half a zone level. So zone levels are numerical from 1 to 10, but they also have A and B, 2A, 2B, 7A, 7B. And for most people, increased a half of a zone size, but not all people changed. So. Just for funsies, it might be fun to go over there and see kind of what kind of zone you are in now. I moved from zone 7B to zone 8A. Now here's uh, my opinion on how these changes affect us. And that is not a whole lot in the short term, but a lot in the long term, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. So in the short term, I don't go by zone as much as we need to go by or as much as I go by frost dates and I think that's generally going to be the better rule of thumb to follow for most gardeners. You want to go by your first projected frost date in the fall and your last projected frost date in the spring. Those two dates typically aren't going to change much. Maybe just you know just a few days here and there. But for the most part the USDA zones changed because the average lowest temperature for many sections of the United States in the winter has increased just slightly. So for the, they're mostly saying that for the most part, we can grow a little bit slightly warmer of crops or get our cooler season crops in the ground earlier. It's not a whole lot of a difference. But I do want to address uh, what I'm seeing and what I'm going to be doing about it. You may have noticed, like me, that there are some pretty intense swings in weather patterns. Um, you know, temperatures really hot in the summer, winters really cold in the winter. A lot of, now I can only speak to where I am in the south, but I do hear from a lot of gardeners in some forums online all across the US and even all across the world. And a lot of other people are seeing the same things where our summers are hotter and our winters are um, colder. And it just, there's just a whole lot of volatility, it seems like, in our weather patterns. And a lot of that is natural, just due to um, some earth changes going on, but some of it is not natural and I need to be careful what I say here so I'm not going to go into um, a whole lot of depth on that but I do believe that not all of these changes are natural and um, I do think that we need to be proactive in how we respond to these things. So here in my zone the the USDA increased our zone a little bit and what that means is that from the first day of winter to the last day of winter when you look at the whole season from a bird's eye view Overall, the temperatures are slightly warmer than they were 10 years ago. The zone map, by the way, from what I understand, is on a 10-year cycle. 
So when it was updated in 2023, at the end of 2023, it hadn't been updated since like 2013 or something or 2012 or something like that. So it's like every 10 years, they kind of look at the data and see, do the zone, does the zone map need to change at all? So it's not something that changes every year. And I think that's why a lot of people in the gardening community are kind of like surprised by this because maybe they've only been gardening for three years and you know their zone has never changed before now because it's been 10 years since the last data was updated. Um, but at, even though overall the temperatures have increased ever so slightly, we are having events inside that winter season that are drastic like drastic dips in temperatures, um, ice storms and winter storms that we have never had before. Dipping down into the negative teens, which I know for some of you, that's like just, you know, just another day in the winter. Um, but for here, that is just unheard of and we're not prepared for it. Um, and the same thing is happening in the summer. When you look at the bird's eye view of summer, our average temperatures are increased a little bit, but we have little cycles within that, not cycles, but little pinpoints within those months where the temperatures are skyrocketed above where they normally are. And oftentimes those skyrocketed temperatures are paired with drought conditions. And it just seems like we are experiencing extremes both in summer and extremes both in winter. And here's how I am preparing for that. I am going to be switching up some of the infrastructure in my garden. And what I mean by that is I am attempting to install an easy solution to be able to quickly add shade cloth if I need it and to quickly add frost cloth if I need it with very little work involved. I'm going to invest a little bit of work up front to get me set up and then um, it should be just a quick switch in and out at a moment's notice when we have those drastic ice storms coming, when we have those drastic summer temperatures coming. And I think a lot of you are seeing the same things, um, just even just all across the world. Like I said, from the chatter that I'm seeing on forums and stuff, it's a pretty common thing that we're seeing. Um, so this is the method that I am using in my garden. I tested it out last year. It worked fantastic. So now I'm just basically rinsing and repeating and doing that for multiple beds this year. And I will be planting things in those beds that are very, if y'all see little, um, there was, I don't know if it was the cinder block or this tubing, but there was ants in one of them. And I've been smushing little ants here and I'm hoping they're not in my sleeves. I feel like one may have gotten up my sleeve just now. Um, but anyway, if you see little ants crawling on my counter, just know it's from this cinder block. Um, <laughs> but anyway, what I'm doing is using a cinder blocks to create a raised bed garden. Oh, I remember what I was saying. I'm going to be using these for crops that are uh, very affected by either extreme heats or extreme cold temperatures and will need protection. Not all crops need that. Some of them are like they can take anything, you know, and so the, those crops are going to be that are kind of more finicky. Those are the ones that are going to be going into these this new raised bed structure. So I'm creating some very small, very shallow raised beds out of cinder blocks. I'm only doing one deep. And one of the reasons for that is the raised beds that I'm building with these don't have a bottom to it. So the, the plants can, and their roots, if they have more than a 12 inch deep root system, they'll easily be able to go into the ground underneath there. It's not an issue. So I'm, I'm not worried about getting height here. Um, I'm just I'm just wanting to get me set up for this next part. So what I'm doing is let's pretend this is one side of my raised bed and let's pretend we have another cinder block over here as the other side of my raised bed. And what I'm doing is I'm as I'm taking 18 inch pieces of rebar. Um, you can get these very cheap at your local hardware store. And I will be putting them in the holes of the cinder blocks, not every hole. This only needs to go about every three to four feet. Um, but I'm just putting a rod, a rebar in the hole of a cinder block. And I'll be putting another one in the hole of this cinder block over here. And then what I have is this is irrigation tubing. I believe it's a half inch, but you can get them um, uh, one inch if you want it to be a little bit more sturdy, but these are really pretty sturdy. 
you can get a huge 50 foot roll of this um, for not much money. So this is a very frugal way to be preparing for these changes that we might be experiencing. Um, but basically what we're going to do is we're cutting them into, this is going to, the distance that you want to cut these is going to depend on how wide your bed is. My beds are only one cinder block width wide, which I believe is 18, 16 or 18 inches. I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, but for, for my width, which I believe is about 18 inches wide. See, there's an ant. <laughs> um, I only need a three and a half foot pieces of this uh, tubing. So into the rebar, I'm just going to take the tubing and slide it over the rebar like that. Take that closer. Um, so it just slides right over that rebar. The rebar goes into the hole of the cinder block and then I'm doing the same thing on this side. And as you can see, it produces this hoop type structure. And what I can put on that hoop is I can very easily drape frost cloth over that to protect when we have those extreme temperature dips. And a lot of times, I need, to, I need to be better about monitoring weather, but a lot of times I don't even notice that these things are coming until, you know, that day. I need to get better on that. But with this, I should be able to very quickly and easily go out there and throw frost cloth over these hoops that I'm building. Same thing in the summer. If we have a day where we are a week where we are projected to have temperatures over 100, I can go out there and I can throw shade cloth over these hoop structures and not there's another ant and um, not have to not have my food suffer any sun scald or um, withering or just flat out dying in those types of temperatures. So I hope that was helpful to y'all. That is how I personally am preparing for some um, trends that I see on the horizon. I think we are I think we're moving away from the days where we could simply just put a seed in the ground. You know what I mean? Um, i I don't like that that's the case, but I think we are moving into a time frame where we are going to have to intervene in our gardens to help our cold crops thrive in the winter and help our heat loving crops thrive in the summer. There are a lot of reasons for that. I do not believe all of them are natural and it doesn't seem like that's going to be getting any better anytime soon. So. This is how I am preparing my garden to be able to still thrive even with these crazy swings no matter what might be causing them. Okay y'all, I hope that was helpful to you and we will see you next time. Bye.